Hi, I'm Simon. Uh, I work at Halal Booking uh, remotely. The company is based in the UK, uh, and I work remotely from St. Petersburg, if you know that city. Um, which means I get to, na to take a very nice train to Helsinki. That's a picture I took. Um, let me talk about a little bit about uh, the company. Uh, we provide hotel reservations for a uh, very niche market that's uh, um, for Muslim families. Uh, we help them find uh, the, the property that they want according to their criteria, like maybe a halal food sort at their property. So that's our website. One second. And uh, so here is our uh, technology stack. We have been using Ruby on Rails for like eight years. I think that's like the first commit. And uh, recently we started using ClojureScript. So uh, that's how our stack looks today. We, we use ClojureScript uh, reagent and a little bit of closure on backend, not, not much. We're still experimenting. Um, so I had a, a few years back, uh, we wanted to start expanding more into hotels. We wanted to uh, start adding more and more, more properties on our website. So it became more important to automate as much as possible. So one of the projects was uh, we wanted to automate, uh, we wanted to let the hotels manage their own content on an extranet. So here's the data that, uh, uh, that they would fill in, like uh, here you have pictures, you have uh, room details, you have location description. Uh, we also have some very uh, detailed uh, stuff that other websites don't care about. So we uh, have detailed information about beaches, uh, wellness and spa facilities, pools. So th that, that was kind of uh, uh, the scope of this project. And uh, so b besides uh, wanted to, so uh, uh, before that I didn't really have uh, uh, a chance to try out ClojureScript on a real project. I only experimented a little bit with it. So this was my first, like, uh, a project I could build for, from scratch. And besides trying out Clojure, I also wanted to uh, achieve uh, certain, uh, you, uh, I wanted to also have a great UI experience as well. So one of the key features of this extranet is uh, all fields are saved automatically. So th that's like the major thing and we wanted to ma make the interface as user friendly as possible. So let me show you how it looks a little bit and then I will explain the details behind it. So you have the extranet. You, uh, we are logged in in uh, this hotel and uh, you have basic fields. You can change them. Uh, you can click on uh, checkboxes, and also we have some more complicated data structures like uh, you have room types, and uh, there are some nested st structures in it, like what kind of uh, areas this room has. So it's uh, pretty detailed, and uh, the uh, wellness and spa we have like a really detailed uh, sh sh schedules. So that, that's kind of the project that uh, we built. And uh, you can notice that everything is saved automatically. There is a save button, but it does nothing, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Just save, feel safe. Uh, so let me explain a little bit about how it works on the, uh, internally. So, one of the concepts that uh, is pushed by and encouraged by reagent community is using a one single atom for your whole state of your whole application. So uh, this is how it would look. Uh, here we have just one, um, uh, one structure, so that's a 
place and it has a website name, stars. And it, you would have other things there as well, like uh, rooms or pools or other stuff. And uh, is uh, any, everyone familiar with uh, how cursors work? Can you raise your hand? OK, cool. I won't spend much time on it. Uh, so, uh, so Reagent provides a, a good way to deal with such nested structures by using a cursor. You can uh, read data from it, and you can update it very easily. So let's move on. And uh, so I, I wanted to really take this concept as a one step fur further. And what, what if I, uh, what if we had uh, not just a single global uh, atom, but also a single global API endpoint? So this is kind of uh, my idea behind it. And uh, let me show you how, how, how it works. So uh, Re reagent allows you to not only use uh, uh, cursors in atoms, it, it also allows you to customize the behavior using a function. So here I have fdb sync function, and it basically it adds a function that uh, does uh, after you update any field, it also enqueues sync. So that's a, a buff function, and it uh, triggers an update, uh, sends an update to the server. And here is this function. It's a little bit too small, I think. Um, but the basic thing is it sends an HTTP request with all the changes that uh, happened. And uh, here is uh, how it would work. So you would use the cursors as usual. So um, you could reset a stars field, so that, that would be a cursor. And it would also send an API call with, with uh, this data structure. And if you change multiple fields, it would combine them all in one message. And uh, as you can notice, um, the data structure looks exactly like uh, FDB Atom. So it's not a different structure. It's exactly the same. It's very symmetrical. And uh, uh, so it's uh, simple and easy to understand. So here is how it would uh, uh, benefit us here is the most basic example. Without using cursors, you, you have an input with, with a value that we are getting from the FDB atom. And on change, we are just updating the value using swap and do nothing else. And uh, because we are using FDB sync function, then it would also trigger an update to the server. But using a, cur using a cursor, we now can extract it, ex extract this logic, and now now the bottom part looks uh, very much ge generic, so we can extract it into a component. So that's a component. It's pretty simple. Uh, it does exactly the same thing. And uh, the important thing is how it looks. So here's the before, and here's the after. So that's very clean. And uh, uh, it's not restricted to this particular field, like website. So we could use it uh, like in a number field, so that's a basic uh, uh, HTML5 number field. So it's very flexible. It, you can focus on how the input looks and uh, leave the state management to to the component. So that's the basic idea behind it. I don't know. Do I have how much time I have? <laughs> okay. Cool. Uh, Let's skip this for now. This is the <laughs> this is the name I came up with because people really value a good name for a concept. So here you have you can use it. Uh, le let me show you a little bit how how collections work. So so far I I showed you how to update basic fields like uh, so property is only one property on on a screen. So let's let me show you how how the updates work for, for collections. So here's a collection of rooms. You can add another room type. And what would usually happen in a typical REST API, you would send a call to the server uh, using a, a different endpoint, using create. So uh, here, I, I wanted to avoid it, it uh, at all. So 
since we're using a monolithic API, so that's just, just one endpoint, uh, uh, by pressing this button, it just adds an empty uh, hash map to the collection, and it, uh, does, uh, it even doesn't do any updates, so it's, it doesn't need to save this because it's empty. But as soon as you enter any field, so I, I can enter this field, and uh, now, it will, now, now, now it will save, and it will automatically create this room because uh, it didn't have the room, but uh, all the f uh, further updates will just update this data structure. So uh, that's how it works, basically, and uh, the important thing is uh, we started by using a list, basic list for this whole, uh, for this whole collection. But the problem with lists is they, uh, the way we reference a, an item in a list, we're using an index of, of this item. And uh, if you rearrange the rooms, the, uh, the index will, uh, will break, will change. So uh, it is very important he here to use a stable ID for, for this kind of thing. So uh, I just thought I would add uh, a stable ID. So I use this library, short ID. It doesn't matter really what you use. You could use UID, but this is shorter. Um, so this is how it would look like if you debug, debug it. So you have a rooms collection, but it's not really a collection, it's a hash map. So the key is the unique, in, uh, the unique uh, string and the value is uh, the, all the fields. So you can really pinpoint any field and update it using this single endpoint. Uh, that's the idea behind it. And uh, so I discussed creating rooms, so that's just a subset of updating. So, uh, and I discussed updating. So what's left is uh, how do you delete things, right? And the, the answer is you don't delete stuff. Uh, because th that's one of the good UI principles that I wanted to implement here. So one of the good UI principles is you don't really let people delete stuff. You let them uh, mark stuff as deleted and you uh, let them restore it. So this is how, how, it, uh, how it works. We just edit a room. We can delete it and it's just marked as deleted so that that's, uh, that's would be a subset of update action as well. So if you if you refresh the page, it, it, it would uh, st still show up there, and you could restore it as well. So that's a subset of update action. So you can really see that uh, how the single endpoint and single action API works. So. Now, the last part of it is uh, how do you handle validations? That's, that would be in a traditional form, you would have a static form, you have a submit button. Uh, after you submit, it would show you a validation error. So this is really the old concept. And uh, here, we don't have really have submit buttons. So how do, validations, uh, how do we do validations? So the, the most, uh, uh, again, the most user-friendly way to do validations is to really restrict the input uh, at, the, at the start. So let me show you in this, in, sorry, in this room, we have room type size, but we don't want to uh, uh, allow negative numbers or zeros here. So you can see here the, the action is restricted, so you cannot really enter anything but a positive number. So that's the most user-friendly way, and it also kind of helps us build a simpler, API, a simpler API. And so the, the only thing left here is that, that couldn't be covered by this approach is really uh, the presence of data. Uh, you can't really uh, restrict that. Uh, so we also have validations. And uh, you can see here if I remove this, so we have a validation that uh, a room type has to have a size, so it shows you above. So that's the data presence validation, and it only happens on the client side. We don't really care about it on the server side because it's 
more like a quality assurance th thing. In, uh, so we can only check it on the client side. And here's how it would look, how it, how it is defined. So the most important part is at the bottom here. That's the valid uh, attribute. And it just uh, plain all the uh, closure. So we check if, uh, for example, here, we check that number of photos is uh, um, greater than some minimum. And uh, we also have some uh, uh, a label to show if the, uh, if the validation doesn't pass. So that, that's, uh, that's the validation part. And uh, I think, how many time I have left? OK, cool. <laughs> I was very afraid that I wouldn't have time to, uh, to, tell, to tell this all, but, and I cut out a few slides. So let's just recap it, and I'll take a, a few questions. Um, so this is the, the basic idea behind it is have a monolithic API that allows me to uh, have really simple input components on the front end. This, this API j has just one single action, that is update. It's just one endpoint as compared to uh, something like a REST architecture. It also, um, I also showed you how to deal with collections that uh, client side generated IDs are important. So. We, we didn't really want to send an additional request to the server to ask for a, uh, an incremental uh, ID, inter integer ID. So this, this really helps us uh, build a, a simpler front end as well. So I, I abbreviate it as a CLID. I think that's a good abbreviation. And I showed you how to deal with validations. Uh, the best way to deal with violations is your user interfa interface constraints, and uh, uh, React uh, allows us to do it very easily. But if you need uh, some data presence violations, you can also add that without, uh, without even the server side violations. And uh, let me show you uh, one, one more thing, if I have it here. Uh, yeah, it's here. No, <laughs> it is hidden because I deleted it. Okay. Uh, this is also kind of a small idea behind uh, that I applied in my project is uh, really deriving the structure of of files the, uh, of source code from the actual business, uh, uh, from the structure that is public on our website. So the way we structured it on our website, for example, for the property fields, we have multiple sections here. So we have general info, we have property details, we have guest, guest uh, age categories. And uh, the traditional way would be to, uh, in your code, to deal with uh, uh, the data structure, so it would be just property, uh, CLGS file. But the way I decided to do it is uh, uh, mirror the same structure from uh, from the from the way it is uh, on our website in, in our code. So you can see in sections directory, we have pretty much everything mirrored, but except for a few things. And uh, you can see general info. You have uh, have general CLGS and so on. So. I think that's uh, like a business, business driven file structure. That's a, a good concept to have. And for some, uh, for some reusable components that, that are pretty generic, then we'll have a separate directory for them. But uh, we wanted to have a separate directory with sections structured just the way they are on our website. And uh, I think that's it. Thank you.